Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are sock full of that, man. Damn right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Cause Stone Cold said so. If you're gonna blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. Coming strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. I am Jeff Howe. Happy 4th of July to everybody out there. If you're listening to this before the 4th, great. If you're listening to it on or after, then happy belated. Whatever. Hope everybody be <laughs> safe. Have a great time. Enjoy your family. Enjoy America. All that fun stuff. So, uh, With that in mind, let's uh, let's go ahead and get on with the show. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He's the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. Matt, uh... We're going to talk about today something that's near and dear to your heart that you kind of configured a few years ago. We're going to be talking a lot about bust rates. Yes, I walked in and Jeff was just spouting numbers. Him and Travis, they were going and breaking them down, and I looked into some of the old ones. But Jeff updated all the bust rate numbers going all the way back to, I guess, the 2014 class? Uh, 2014, we're not quite done, but I think we're we're done with bust rates and, and things of that nature for that class. So I think from that standpoint, we're we're good. Um, and we're already tracking 2015, which, hint, hint, doesn't look very good. Uh, just to let you know kind of what yeah. Tom Herman's working with on this roster. But we're going to break all that down on the show this week. We said we're going to play schedule game, but uh, when we introduced the third member of our team here in a little bit, there was uh, 360 was not cooperating yeah, today that's my uh, on the drive-in. No, it happens. Uh, I actually missed a recording date a couple weeks ago because I made oh, the mistake of telling Matt, Hey, we need to go on Tuesday. And Matt calls me on Tuesday, and I'm like vacuuming the house. I'm like, what's Matt talking about? Like, oh, crap. But anyway, Which stuff, also needs to be done. Right. We live in transparency. You know I mean? Stuff happens. Uh, so let me bring in uh, the third member of our team. Uh, he's our renaissance man here on the show, our lockdown corner. Lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All America, 2002 semifinals for the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth round draft choice of the New York Giants in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year. In the CFL with Johnny Manziel's Hamilton Tiger Cats. That's right, baby. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas right, in the Johnny, 40 acres. Where he earned his degree. Right. <laughs> if he knew where his tearing was, he would wear it proudly. Nevertheless, he is a card-carrying member of DBU. Number 21 in your program. Number one in your hearts. Mr. Rod Babers. And Rod B., I got to tell you before we get started, man. Another, like LHN lately has been going like on the Rod Babers carousel of football games. The uh, 2001 A&M game was on LHN randomly nice. last night. Oh, was that the one at? Is that the one here or there? There. Oh, one was that? Yeah, yeah that was your that junior was a good game. We mashed on them that game. Yes, 21-7. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we mashed them. They kept trying to throw it. fade balls against you and Quinn yeah. Jammer for some reason. I don't, I don't know, know why. Yeah, our secondary was too nasty by then. They should have been trying to run it actually on us. You know what I mean? Yeah. We have shown that you could run it on us. You couldn't pass on us at that point. No. No. Wasn't happening. Wasn't happening. Now with Nathan Bass uh, back and there myself. Sean McDonough uh, is very tickled by your quote of uh, nobody catches the ball on my side of the field, not even me. Yes. Oh, yeah. They mentioned that. That was the game yes. that nice. they showcased it. Yes. Good. Yes. I'm glad Mac Brown did not like that quote. He it, really got on me about that one. He said, don't uh, don't demean yourself. Don't degrade yourself. Well, what would Coach Akina tell you about Be that? Be positive. Ah. Coach Akina, you just dropping money, man. You just dropping money, baby. And he was right. I did yeah. drop a ton of money. <laughs> That's That's a good a way to put it. Like yeah. I told you, though, the last time I saw Dwayne Aquina and talked to Dwayne Aquina, he told me he's pretty sure if he had one guy in a man-on-man situation, you're pretty high up there on the guys he would pick. Yeah, he gives me a lot of love. I saw him at uh, Mac Brown's college football. Like, Oh, yeah, you all have the Hall, Hall of, of Fame, Fame deal. deal. Yeah, that was like right around spring game, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Coach, uh, Coach Brew was there. Tim Brewster was there. It was, As we uh, talked about. Yeah, that was really fun. So the station ain't that lit, is it? Uh, back he wouldn't throw up the Texas. horns. Everybody trying to get try to get a picture of him throwing the horns. He said he told me he said I get fired if I threw up the horns. Yeah. There's a picture that leaked. <laughs> they yeah. said, look, like I get fired. Yeah. They fired. I think, I think it's current <laughs> yeah, That's how, that's how crucial it is. Yeah, at this point. Even if I knew the people knew the event and they knew the, the background history, still don't care. Like That's how crucial it would be. Is, I uh, actually uh, just heard, saw yeah. some funny quotes about them having to redo the office for Jimbo that he thought it looked like too much like a nightclub. Yeah, oh, black yeah, some walls. Ones. I saw that. Yes. Black walls, yeah. Yeah, but that you know what's interesting yeah. about that is like from Mac to Charlie yeah. to Tom Herman, that head coach's office at Texas hadn't changed that much. 
No. Looks the inside of it. I mean, yeah, it's from what pretty. I've seen. Now. That's a cool thing to think about. We say that, but whenever they get ready to do this Moncrief renovation here in a couple yeah. of years, I got a feeling Tom Herman's fingerprints going to be all over that. Yeah, that mm-hmm. thing could end up looking like the Playboy Mansion out there. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why not? <laughs> Which actually is probably outdated, so I take that. Right. <laughs> this is the, the old thing is. Well, you said now it would look different. like the Playboy yeah, Mansion, yeah. not the. They got, the they got something environment. new, a new upgrade. Um, speaking of upgrades, the one thing Tom Herman's got to upgrade to figure, and, and we'll talk schedule game at some point, folks. We're just not going to get to it today. We're not going to just you know. We got plenty of time for the schedule right. game too. Yeah. So, but one thing I the one thing I wanted to hit on in light of some news. Actually, this is the first bit of news we've had with this team, guys, in like seems like months. Edwin Freeman announces that he's going to graduate transfer. He won't play his final year at Texas, which, you know, we'd heard his name linked to transfer rumors all throughout the spring. It's not a shock. He had the, uh, what was it, the triceps tear, Mm -hmm. had surgery on that. So he's going to try to play somewhere else. Now, what this got me thinking, first off, I don't think this is that big of a deal to the linebacker room. Number one, because they didn't have him in the spring, and they were already shorthanded. Yeah. And it seemed like Todd Orlando was doing a good job of manufacturing depth. And Rod, was oh, he oh, even in the in the top two, like in the depth chart? No, I, I, I didn't. Think I didn't think so. Yeah, I mean, not since it, like that first Notre Dame game. It's <clears> been like that first year he was. But since Charlie's then, Charlie's like, last year. Charlie's last year had like forty nine tackles, three sacks. No, he started like he nine started, tackles for loss. Like Ed games. Freeman was yeah. a big part of that defense. Yeah. I'm talking but, about Hump and Tom Herman. Yeah, it just seemed like just ever since like the first spring, it just seemed like he either didn't fit or didn't click with the staff. It just didn't fit. Something just wasn't right. But Ed Freeman's got his degree. He's going to move on. But I tell you why, Rod. This doesn't, you know, when you look at this this linebacker depth chart, if I can talk right today, I don't think it's that big of a deal. And I want to go back to a quote, Todd Orlando, and I asked him about this uh, in the spring mm-hmm. about just cross training guys and manufacturing depth because we talked about spring is kind of the one time where really you can do that. You can experiment. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. the cl- once you get into camp, you might have a couple weeks where you're into evaluation, but. Mm. Once you hit that, after you get through that first scrimmage, you're yeah. really focusing on your opener. That's right. And maybe even going into the second game, depending on what your schedule looks like. So I want to read you this quote from Todd Orlando about cross-training guys. Uh, when I asked him about it in the spring, he said, we do it all the time. So including in the camp, throughout the season, yeah. so we do it all the time. Uh, they're all in the same room together, so when you're teaching them, you're always telling them to look at different positions. We don't separate outside to inside. Our deal is the three best players are going to play so we challenge so we challenge the guys. If a middle linebacker mm-hmm. goes down, then we're not playing the second middle linebacker. We're playing the fourth best backer. So if that guy's a rover or he's a B, we're going to move him to that spot. Same goes for other positions on the defense. If you're a field side safety or a boundary side safety, we're going to play the third best safety if somebody goes down, not the second best out of position. Yeah. It's that, all across the board and it helps with depth because you don't want to put a guy in just to put a guy in. You want to put your best athletes and then do our job as a coach and get them right. I love it. Like that's literally you don't. It, it seems simple, but like you don't hear that that often with coaches. Like that's positionless football, and like you hear about that in other sports. But having the ability to have not only players that can adapt and do that, it shows that their football IQ is going to be fit into what they're doing, and then to know that physically that you have the skill set to be able to do that. If Texas really can play that way, that'd be a luxury to have. Rod, when you talk about manufacturing depth, uh, I did a story on this. It's up on the site at Horse 24-7 right now. Um, When you look at guys playing a certain number of snaps and manufacturing depth and not really relying on a lot of guys, but just you want your best on the field. When you look at the last two Texas defenses that have been really good, 2014 and 2017, they had that in common. Um, I, I got these numbers from Pro Football Focus and just broke them down. So the 2014 defense under Charlie Strong had five guys log 800 or more snaps. Todd Orlando had three guys last year that hit the 800 snap mark. Uh, all told, 10 members of the 2014 defense were on the field for 500 or more snaps, uh, which is nearly identical to the number of players who had the same snap totals for Orlando in 2017, which was nine. Orlando's defense only had 12 players see the field for 499 or fewer snaps, so under the 500 mark. 13 on that first Charlie Strong defense did the same. So you're looking at playing basically your best guys and then maybe a couple backups, but you're really just – I would love to see the numbers for the next year when they had the drop-offs. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought you that up. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I will just read straight from my article. The 2015 defense had nine players see time on the field to the tune of five, more than 500 snaps. So. Okay. 500 plus territory. Not too much of a drop off. But a staggering 25 players played fewer than 500 snaps. 
five guys were between four and five hundred. Seven guys were in between three and four hundred snaps. And I'd be interested to see uh, those three to four hundred guys. Normally, unless you're a specialist, those are the type of guys that we end up talking about that like you lose your job or. So they didn't lose the front line guys. You still had your guys that kind of were your your core of what you built around, but you lost the depth. Yeah, your depth was on, terrible. On that. Yeah. And that'll uh, mean your special teams is probably worse because those are those guys that are young and developing. Your depth wasn't that. that good for 2016 either. The 2016 defense didn't utilize that many bodies with nine members in the 500-plus snap club, but 19 different guys were among those who recorded 500 or fewer snaps. You had four in the four to 500 range, two in the three to 400 range, and six guys in the 200 to 300 range in terms of the number of snaps they played. So, which would explain the cycle of the Vance, Bedford, Manny, Diaz, or at least I would say explain it. It, it further explains the mm-hmm. cycle right. of those first-year guys because they had a lot of depth and a lot of talented, experienced depth, and they lost a lot of that experience. Still had, still had some, you know, some talent, right. but they lost a lot of the experience depth, and then it ended up hurting them. Um, so I wonder. I mean, that's what that's the Todd Orlando's challenge is this year. Yeah, the perfect to avoid one the cycle. He's got to somehow find a way to build the depth. Not at the front line. The front line, you're good. We all agree. Yeah. The Hagers, the Amenahus, the the Gary Johns, yeah, the Chris like the Mac Boyd, Brown, the Devontae early Davis, years. the Brandon Jones. We agree at the front line. You're just like you was probably in 2015 and probably going back to 2012. Where go look at those defenses. You got NFL first round picks and and draft picks on Talents, those defenses. Yep. Uh, but you lost the depth at the at the lower end of your depth chart. And that's what Tarlando's Orlando's got to do to, to generate that or to build it. Now what he's got and what Texas had then too, I mean, he's got a good recruiting class behind it too to help build that depth. You know what I mean? Well, and you look at the big, I mean, all of last year, the big plays that really killed Texas, it wasn't as if, you know, you were horrible for 75 of the 90 snaps. You were pretty damn good. It's just like we were just talking about when you have those few players, you lack depth, you have a few holes. Only a few snaps have to go wrong, and you can easily lose a football game that quick with just a couple scores. So, Rod, I'm glad you brought up recruiting because that's where I wanted to take this this week. Now, we're not going to talk recruiting in terms of who's doing what or the Chris Adamora commitment or anything like that. You want that, uh, go get with Mike Roach and EJ Holland on no interviews, please. Uh, support those guys in the podcast. They do, which is kind of the recruiting arm of what we do at Horns 24-7. I kind of, it is. I don't know why I threw that in there. But I want to look at bust rates, Rod. And we, we've talked about bust rates. And, and like Matt said, the, you can see my notepad. I went through my beautiful mind, Russell Crowe stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 I got, got it all weekend. the time. Uh, <laughs> we so got I papers got everywhere. The Ed Freeman right. news got me thinking, well, how did the 2014 class do? And the answer is not, not very good. It wasn't great. And this is something that Matt's brought up. Uh, very astutely, that when you look at some of these recruiting classes, especially recently in this current decade, you got to take into account massive either coaching changes or you know right around 2010, 2011, that coaching overhaul where Mac basically just completely overturned his staff. Yeah, almost got a whole new staff. You can mm-hmm. manufacture that you're going to have a huge butt straight when those years when you have the coaching transition just from either fit ideology or just lifestyle or the school. So overall, like that Texas has to first we start looking at bust rate whenever Mac Brown and staff started to fall off with that horrid 09 class. But then it goes on for four years as if Mac had his rebirth. But every year we've just been resetting and resetting. So it's really hard to ever have a class that retains a decent bus rate because you're already having guys that don't fit because you have something new coming. And then, like I was telling Jeff, in addition to that is we just need right now, Texas fans, one cycle for a coach to recruit so he can start to have his own guys. And then you can actually stabilize inside with a coaching staff that maybe he's retained for a year or two because those are the type of things that you take for granted for all the 2000s but can lay a foundation where you're sort of just – retooling what you have instead of having to literally rebuild. And then now we're on like the third rebuild in literally seven years. So going to the 2014 class, <clears throat> this was a class that it's your classic uh, transition class. Mac Brown and his staff pretty much built it. Charlie Strong and his staff had to finish it. And in random fact, Edwin Freeman was actually the first high school prospect to commit to Charlie Strong. So that's ironic. This, uh, yeah, yeah, just a random fact to throw in there. It would have been be the beginning of the end of his first cycle. So, twenty three signees total, and Matt, we figured, and I want you to bring this up. We figured 
really your top two, your your categories at both ends of the spectrum are really what matters. And we broke this down, and I'll, I'll give Matt credit for this. I've kind of taken Matt's idea and run with it. You basically break your recruiting class down into four different areas. Your NFL caliber players, which are guys that are draft picks, or did you spend like a year plus on a practice squad? Were you a guy that kept mm-hmm. getting multiple chances to make an NFL roster? And, you know, yeah. did you were, were you a guy that the league valued? Good yeah. example would be like that. 2009 class, the 15% that made it were your Chris Whaley, who sort of made it to your Okafor, to your, mm-hmm. you know, Vaccaro. That's First round pick, exactly. right. Um, so that's your NFL caliber players. Then you've got your significant contributors. I think it, the, the guy that I th- automatically think of when I think of significant contributor, Steve Edmond. Yeah. Like multiple yep. year starter. Yeah. guy. All conference type guy. Just wasn't an NFL guy for yeah. whatever reason. Then you got your minimal contributors, which your guy – Maybe he started a couple games. He was a key backup for you. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe he was maybe he was a guy that really didn't play that much, but he got his degree. He helped you out from an we APR were standpoint. Using names like Aaron Barnett was one on the fringe of being yeah. that guy. It was like those are the type of guys where you see him on the field yeah. a tiny bit, but Kennedy it's hard Estelle to come up. Those guys I threw in the minimal yeah. contributors, even though he got dismissed. You know, he was a guy that just started I think nine games in his career, even though his career didn't last that long. And then you got your busts, your guys that you just. You and got you know, little to nothing out of them. They were here a year, then gone. Yes, yeah. so you got next to nothing out of them. Yeah, purge guys. So for the class of 2014, and I guess this is – you can't really fault Charlie for this. To me, this is on on Mac and the staff They're kind of reaching for guys, not evaluating as well, maybe panicking a little bit. Your NFL percentage is tracking right now. Percentage of NFL players in the 2014 class, 8.7%. And the guys you're tracking to be NFL guys right now, Deontay Foreman and Puna Ford. Yeah. That's it. Because that's it. Amani Foreman and Jason Hall have already been cut. And that's a perfect example of recruiting, too, that like the diamonds in the rough become the NFL gold in that class, too. Your significant contributors, it's a pretty. It's 34.8% of your class. It's a pretty big percentage. That's Gerard Hurd, Amani Foreman, Ed Freeman I put in there because he was a really good player for that one year and, and stuck around for multiple years. John Bonney, Andrew Beck, Chris Nelson, Jake McMillan, Jason Hall. Now, Chris Nelson could improve that that NFL caliber number, depending yeah. on the kind of year he has, but it ain't going to grow up that much, and it's on track to be the worst class in terms of NFL caliber players produced since we can track recruiting classes online going back to 2002. Yeah. Uh, you don't really want your minimal contributors category to be that big either. Cause you know, you don't want guys to just, Hey, he gave us a little something. You want more than that for yeah. your recruits that right now for the 2014 class is 21.6% of the class. Lorenzo, Joe, Dorian Leonard, Alex Anderson. I've got Elijah Rodriguez in there right now. He could move up to that category mm-hmm. of being a significant contributor. Yeah. Uh, and then Terrell Cooney and Garrett Gray. Why is the 2014 class not good in a lot of people's eyes? Why shouldn't it be viewed good? Your bust rate. Your bust rate is 30. 30.4%. Yeah, man, that's high. That's Derek Roberson, Duke Catalan, Roderick Bernard, Jermaine Roberts, Blake Whiteley, Cameron Hampton, and Kevin Shorter. More than a third mm-hmm. of your class. That you that, got nothing out of. What was that? Uh, what was the bus rate for that? Was it 09? What was the bus rate for 09? So, Rod, yeah, 80. This is yeah. why, this is the challenge. <laughs> it was something ridiculous. No, it is. I'm looking this at it right is here. The yeah. cha- this is the challenge Tom Herman has to rectify this program is you got to manage your roster. And I said, sat here on the show and said, I said the first 18 to 24 months he's on the job, managing the roster will be Tom Herman's toughest mm-hmm. task by far. Don't forget play calling, whatever it's roster management. That's how you're going to get this thing turned around. I just want to give everybody kind of a history lesson of what you're dealing with, with these classes. Now, when you start, when you look at the early part of the decade, when we can start tracking recruiting classes, you'll notice the NFL caliber players produced, you're above 30% in most of those years. Yeah. 2002, 30.8. 2003, 36.8. 2004, 26.3. Not great. But then 2005, 46.7% of your recruiting yeah. class mm-hmm. were yeah. NFL caliber players. In 2006, you're down to 16. But then in 2007, 37.5. In 2008, you're 30. That's your yeah. Manny Achos, your Blake Gideons, mm-hmm. your Aaron Williams, your Fozzie Whitakers, your Earl Thomases, mm-hmm. guys that were really kind of the the core of that 2009 national yeah. championship. Anytime you had a dip, you made title. up for it with a spike. Yeah, and anytime much. you had basically 30% NFL success, like that's the number. Because right. you yeah. look those 02 to 05 classes and that even that 08 one. So from 02 to, 02 to 08, Texas only had three classes record a 30% or higher bust rate. 
2003, which also had a 30 plus percent NFL caliber rate, mm-hmm. yeah. was a 31.6. 2004, 31.6, and then 2006 you had a 36 percent bust rate. That class was not very good, and that kind of that contributes to the issues we started to see in 2008, 2000, really 2009, and then the, the five and seven year in 2010. Now, where the script flips is when you start with 2009. Here is your bust rate for the starting with the class of 2009. 2009. Fifty percent bust rate, which means there were half as twenty signees, half a recruiting class. You got nothing, nothing. out of yeah. zero and then wasted scholarship. Eighty percent, I guess, is the bottom two bottom contributors. Yeah, well, I've got <laughs> I've got it at seventy percent. Yeah, for the class of two thousand nine. Okay, that well, I take that back. It's seventy five percent. Yeah, bus are bus are minimal, minimal contributors. contributors yeah. Yes, that's pretty big. Yeah, and that was this is because I was very biased back in like two thousand and eleven. I still called Garrett Gilbert a bust because he transferred I'm, out of Texas. I actually, even put, though he wasn't a bust, yeah, but it was an odd. I actually put I actually put Garrett Gilbert yeah. in the significant contributor category. Yeah, because yeah. okay, if, if you the difference in our numbers, if you started a year quarterback in Texas, then to me, yeah, you are right about that. Yeah, I was I still jaded at the time. He started more games than most of the quarterbacks <laughs> we've had since Colts. So, yeah. Class of 2010, 34.8% bust rate. Darius White, Chris Jones, Taylor Bible, uh, Adrian White, uh, Aaron Benson, Connor Wood, Traylon Shedd, Darius Cotton. Yeah. Yep. Now, 2011, it's only a 13.1% bust rate. But your minimal contributor category is 30, 30.4%. That's about half. Yeah. When you add them up. That's not very nah, – but, I mean, you had a 21.7% NFL hit rate in this class. That's Malcolm Brown, Quandre Diggs, Jackson Shipley, Cedric Reed, uh, Mikel Thompson, and then <laughs> – That 30, was the core of that team. 34.8% yeah. <laughs> uh, significant contributors, Steve Edmond, Desmond Jackson, Cedric Flowers, Sherrod Evans, Josh Cochran, David Ash. That's the Mac Man, Brown a hanging on the of thread. Significant contributors too. Yeah, that was the end of the Mac Brown. Like him yeah. having little Quandre, little Shipley coming in. Then you get a top first round pick in Malcolm Brown. Like that was so the again, hope. Again, again, 2012. Your bust rate's pretty low, 17.9 percent. But your highest category is your minimal contributors, which is 39.2 percent of your freaking yeah. class. You got hardly anything out of, or not as much as you should have. Kennedy Estelle, Kendall Sanders, Cameron Hughes, Adrian Colbert, Bryson Eccles, Tim Cole, Brandon Moore, Nick Jordan, Dalton Santos, Kevin Vaccaro. Guys, for the most part, were victims of the Charlie Strong purge mm-hmm. that got themselves booted out of the program. Yep. So Dalton really, Santos is tight. you weren't able to completely overcome that first wave of just just disastrous recruiting classes. And even the, like, the 2010 class, even the guys that you did have who were you know contributors – Man, a lot of those guys ended up just getting hurt, and some of them at the most inopportune time. Like everybody talks about David Ash in that 2014 season. Mm-hmm. How different is that season if Dom Espinosa doesn't get hurt? Yeah, both of them game. at the very yeah, beginning. Both of them going down early. You know? Yeah, and you Disastrous. still got you know Case McCoy. People can say what they want about Case McCoy. He beat A and M in the last game, and he beat oh he won his last game against Oklahoma. Um, Case is a key contributor. John, yeah. I have him in significant contributors. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. your so NFL, yeah. your NFL guys, but Rod, Rod, think about how many of these guys had injuries. Your NFL guys and your significant contributors from 2010: Jackson Jeffcoat, Jordan Hicks, Trey Hopkins, Carrington Bynum, Adrian Phillips, Mike Davis, Dom Espinosa, John Harris, Case McCoy. Like more than half of those guys had a like significant injury at one point, one point during the season. Yeah, yeah, they I weren't agree. maximized well at Texas, except for maybe Case McCoy. <laughs> the other ones that. were all injured. Yeah. So the question is, how much of this, uh, the this inability to maximize this talent, mm-hmm. how much of it is on the coaching staff? How much of it was on the culture? You know, what I mean, I think a, a lot of it staff, roster management. I think okay. some. Of, I think some of it with this All right here. I think. I think it was lazy evaluations in recruiting. Most I think of it's on the for coaches. For the two thousand nine ten, those guys mm-hmm. were bust. Yeah. Yeah. I think that a lot of that's on the coaches. Now some of the other that's stuff why we're though we're entering a tough world now. Why you've, you've got, got guys in that stuff in why you've equation. got guys in that minimal contributor category? I think a lot of that goes back to player development. And keep in mind, Rod, starting with that 2011 season, that was the Benny Wiley Jeff Madden deal yeah. that didn't work for I anybody. That. Yeah, they didn't work for anybody. That experiment too. Well, I mean, about the strength there were injuries program. are very plentiful then too. So your first chance to recover, really recover, you, you could have recovered with 2000, yeah, the 2013 class. 13. Well, your bust rate for 2013. Forty percent. I was gonna say, yeah, you thought it was a chance. That's the last Matt no. class, right? and your and your yeah, and your minimal contributors for that group, twenty six point seven percent of your class. That's Darius James, Jake Rollerson, Jake Oliver, Jacory Warwick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
I, I honestly, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's brutal. It, and, that's, and then you're hitting this tough tra- and then you're to get coaching you've got a, coaching change. You've got a twenty yeah. percent you've got a twenty percent NFL hit rate, but who are the three guys? Jeff Swaim, who didn't hardly play and they wouldn't use nearly probably like he should have been while he was here. Kent Perkins, who's a guard, you can only have so much impact as a guard. Yeah. And then Tyrone Swoops, who's playing a completely different position in the NFL than he played here. Playing tight end now. Those, I mean, those classes tell the exact story right there. Like Texas, as we've heard from NFL teams, like they have some value talent down there. They could do something, but there's a ton of holes and they've been trying to fix it and just plug things and really have never had a unified vision. If you look at a past decade since basically that 09 class to where we're at going into this class. And it's just whenever you thought you might have Mac resurrecting something then when you throw all the change in and then we don't know what type of offense we're running then we're starting to run a different offense so it's just going to be so much chance to be thrown in there that (laughs) texas is constantly fighting just to get back to average and really the 2013 class you can say is the really the class that killed two different coaching regimes because it showed (laughs) that mac had really lost his grip recruiting in the state because that 2013 class excuse me at one point in time texas had kyle hicks Ricky Seals Jones, Durham Smythe, and Ashawn Robinson all in that class. Mm, yeah. You yeah. also led for Andrew Billings at one point closer to signing day and ended up losing him. And you passed on JT Barrett as your quarterback. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was that Mac couldn't recruit as well anymore. It's that it wasn't as easy anymore mm-hmm. for Mac. You well, know what and I mean? he wasn't like, fitting like the, the, po- the powers had risen by then. But Riles I think once it got once it offense. got hard though, Rod, once it got hard, I I think but, I don't but think then he, handled then it he had starts to bring in new coaches and everything like he started to change he changed it wasn't if he did not say he wanted to reinvent the program after nick saban mm-hmm. beats him and say we want to go powerful ball we want to be sec yep. and maybe he was right about his vision but he was wrong about the uh execution, execution of it you know what i mean mm-hmm. but either way he is the one that changed and when he changed everybody around him the baylors the tcus the u of h's they all kind of rose up at the same time. Yeah, it, was just, it was the it was a perfect storm against him, and he was a prisoner of his own success. Like, and that, that, I agree. Look at all the coaches the lack he brought of vision. in. Look at all the coaches he brought in. They're damn good coaches. Yeah, go well, look at all of them. Yeah, damn, all, they, all of them are right now thriving. The culture was so toxic here, man, because of the way he went about changing the program. Yeah, that there was no way anybody was going to succeed. There. Well, in this two, this 2013 class, it was just one more example of the fact that Matt. It's, I guess, to to kind of tie what you're saying, Rod, and what I'm saying together. It's almost I think we're like, saying the same thing. It's right? almost like misguided effort. Like, yeah, Mac you're didn't working know what he was hard. Watching. You're, you're working hard. The you're, not, to, you're working hard. You're not working very road smart. Road to hell is paved yeah. with good intentions. He yeah. didn't and realize he had great intentions. Yeah, and he did. He made. And you know what? Nick Saban football has ruled <laughs> college football since. Yes. So Mac Brown wasn't off. Yeah. He knew he was like, this is where it's going. Damn it! If I could, if I could replicate that. Then Texas is going to be winning championships like Nick Saban's. About but to that win doesn't fit. But it didn't. He was wrong about the culture and it, compatibility the and changing too quickly. Like he just, he just kind of went on a madman kind of. And then he I think changed. he was so isolated well, at the time, though. He was too. Richard Nixon in office, mm-hmm. and nobody could convince him otherwise. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he couldn't even. You couldn't sit there and convince him act otherwise. And even though I can say he was right about where where the success, like the the, the successful blueprint should have been, be. he couldn't. He couldn't bring the program to that point. It yet. took it took you know this I mean? it took this class. He still ain't there, and it he had this... to. I mean, identify his workforce too. I mean, look at what would happen whenever the rest of the state at that time, when you're de- deciding to change your entire identity, while you're in the state of Texas that it invented the spread, and these other coaches have a streamlined workforce with no learning curve. You maybe be able to do that in SEC country where you're road grading, and that's what Saban does. But here. It's going to be a lot harder, especially if you can't identify what you're watching in the style of football in this culture in this Big 12 conference and not be able to do that here and then know we're going to run. It's just going to make you not fit for all those recruits. No, no, he was that right and wrong because now look at where everything's going. Is Everything is air raid. Everything is spread. Exactly. It's, it's, it's trickling up. So he was right and wrong. I don't even know. Like I, Maybe there's nothing he could have done. Maybe this, My point, maybe yeah. this was inevitable for Texas. My point on the recruiting deal you know was I mean? it, it took this classroom to realize that he needed to hire a guy like Patrick Suttis. He had to completely reinvent the way he recruited because it wasn't just – you were long past the point of well, you know, we offered and you know, we offered twenty five guys and got twenty three commitments, yeah. twenty three signees. Like you're, it, it, it was it, fab it fifty five style. Took still. this dumpster fire of a recruiting cycle and be like, oh, maybe we need to change the way we're doing things. Like, yeah, you think? Yeah, no. What well, once? Well, 
that would have worked if a and M just isn't coming up out of nowhere. You and know what I mean? Bryles and and Bryles at Baylor and U of H. And Jerry TCU, Patterson. When all these people started get, being able to... Texas never used to get into recruiting battles with TCU or Baylor. <laughs> there was no battle. Or U of H. We never... We were not... That was never talked about. There they was no weren't even a about. challenger. No, it was only AM that we got into a recruiting battle with, and we scoffed at most of the idiots that chose AM over Texas. But it all changed when Matt Brown reinvented the program. Texas got into legitimate recruiting battles with Baylor and TCU and all this. And I was like, man, the game has changed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he used to rule this this state with an iron fist, and he he lost that stranglehold on the state. And when he did, I think he his recruiting pitch when he had the stranglehold was perfect. Hey, we all from we're Texas. You better come or you don't. You're gonna get left out. Hell yeah, you better get on that. You better get on that bandwagon. But when you are when you are not the monopoly in the right. state, when you are not the most successful program in the state, that pitch don't work. Yeah. That pitch don't work, and that pitch wasn't working. You had to change the pitch. So the 2013 class kind of exemplified the struggles Mac Brown was having towards the end I of agree. his tenure. And with that class bottoming out and so many busts in that class, guys, that a lot of those guys think about this. I mean, all those guys left. During within Charlie's like by the start really the start of his second year DeAndre Davis Rami Hamad Desmond Harrison Shavosky Collins Eric Kuhn Montro Meander Darius James Jake Rollerson like all those guys were gone pretty much by the time Charlie's second year started I think Rollerson was I still there about half the those second guys. year yeah I know those <laughs> names are like yeah Montro like, Meander oh, I forgot about, yeah. about Lanky Montro yeah um yeah so that class not only showed the issues Mac Brown had it gutted Charlie Strong's roster in mm. terms of having veteran a veteran presence Courage, baby. and then you go to 2014 and then look at the high bust rate for that class. So now you're taking another veteran group away from Charlie Strong. So you figure, okay, 2015 is the year he's going to reload. And so far, 15 saving him. Your 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 NFL your NFL yeah. rates tracking pretty good right now. Malik Jefferson, yeah. Connor Williams, Chris Warren, might be the turnaround around year actually. Sean Elliott, yeah. Michael Dixon, but 30 percent bust rate for 2015. Ryan Newsom, DeAndre McNeil, Kyle Loxley, Cecil Cherry. Devin Eric Clarington, Devontae Lampkin, Gilbert Johnson, Buck Major, Matthew Merrick. I'll say what I like what I like about the bus rate, but what is promising about that bus rate, it's guys who honestly, some of you never stepped on campus. Right. I mean, it literally was just, they got off of the scholarship and some didn't work out. And most of them, either they stepped on campus, didn't work out. Like they never stepped on the field or within the program. So it's not, it's, it's a bus, yes, in terms of the scholarship number, but they didn't the the, pre, the program didn't fail them like it did a lot of the other guys in this period we're talking about when Max yeah. reinvented. And if the it stays exactly where it's at, that'll end up not being bad because we we're talking about if you are because this is going to be the first one that That's has true. to endure a coaching change. Yeah. And we were just remarking earlier, like trying to think of a place where you could maybe see a bust rate that didn't go down with the coaching change, like if say when Urban took over Ohio State or a few situations where you see immediate success in year one. I bet those correlate together. And if Texas State at 30 and nobody had no other busts out of that class that would be pretty good considering some of those you got to factor in or just with the coaching change you're going to be gone and, and when you look at tom herman managing the roster those guys with that 30 percent bust rate i mean how many of those guys were gone by the time tom herman got here like ryan newsom deandre yep. mcneil kyle exactly. loxley cecil cherry like pretty much all those guys except like buck major and matthew merrick all those guys were already gone by the time yep. tom herman so major the obama uh, facebook guy? no that's uh no, you're thinking one. of buck burnett Bug Burnett. It that, was a bug. From Sorry. Wimberley. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, no, the yeah, yeah. My Wimberley bad. Texan. Yeah. My no. bad. Bug but, man. you know, that, that 2000. <laughs> He's in that 06 bus class. <laughs> that 2015 class could end up looking a lot like go back to 2003, where you had like almost a 40% NFL hit rate, but you had a 30 plus percent bust rate for the same class. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's just so much damn talent in this class. Because, like, look at the guys in the significant attributors category, Rod. And, and how, you tell me how many of these guys you think have a legit shot. To make an NFL roster, Anthony Wheeler, Charles Amenahu, PJ Locke, no Chris Minnehu. Boyd, Patrick Vahey, John Burt, Brecken Hager, Devontae Davis, uh, then Brandon Hodges and Tristan Nicholson. A three or four, yeah, Hager. That, that are going to have like a legit real yeah. chance to get three drafted. Yeah, easy. Yeah, even yeah. Burt's speed, even though he hasn't done much here. Exactly. Like he's like, that, 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 that. <laughs> the combine runs a four three. Yeah. Somebody's like going to somebody's going to have yeah. John Burt in their camp he's to their see Joe what's Ross. there. You know, I agree with you on that. So it, it just could be one of those classes. But in 2016, in the class right now, <clears throat> you're tracking at a 20 uh, over 21 percent bust rate. Eric Fowler, Gene Delance, Jordan Elliott, Chris Daniels, Marcel Southall, Peyton Oakland. Those are guys so that were gone when Tom Herman got here, like mm -hmm. the first spring or by the first season or whatever. Yeah. So 
Uh, but I mean, when you let me pull up the 2016 class, and real then the quick. 2015 class, you only had two guys that have transferred out since Herman. So when you look at the Herman factor, it hasn't been as much now. Maybe some guys left to the league. Be? I guess Brendan Hodges is a grad transfer. Yep. And who would the other one be? I'm not sure. You had just ran it off at the bottom two names there. DeAndre in the was DeAndre McNeil a Herman transfer? Nope. There no. was somebody after him, right? Matthew Merrick, I guess. There you go. Matthew yeah, Merrick, yeah. the gray shirt. So let me pull up 2016 real quick where we've got a couple more minutes. Now that's tracking at a pretty high bust rate, but look at the guys still on the roster. The third year is key. How yeah. many of these guys have a chance to contribute? Devin Duvernay, Brandon Jones, Patrick Hudson, Jeffrey McCulloch, Shane Bouchelle, who I think would probably stay in the significant he's, he's contributor category. He's already there, yeah. Colin Johnson. Andrew Fitzgerald, J.P. Urquidez, Kyle Porter, Denzel Okafor, Eric Cuffey, DeAndre Christmas, uh, Lil Jordan Humphrey, oh, Chris man. Brown, DeMarco Boyd, Malcolm Roach, Gerald Wilbon, Davion Curtis, Tope Amade, Donovan Duvernay, Zach Shackelford. Yeah, you got a lot still up in the air. Yeah, so class. there's a lot to be determined. And a lot of guys who, like you said, this year is a big year for them. Colin mm-hmm. Johnson, Lil Jordan Humphrey, Devin Duvernay, Malcolm Roach. Yeah. All those guys, this is a big year for so them. So you look at the 2015 class and Tom Herman managed to really – Kind of rectify some of those guys. I mean, mm-hmm. how many of those guys in the NFL category? I mean, Holton Hill, Deshaun Elliott, Malik Jefferson, they played their best football under Tom Herman. Mm-hmm. When think about these last three classes we're talking about, they actually have to where you're starting to get NFL and contributors well over 50%. If you can get each, uh, each class every single time to have yeah. 60% is the number you always want. If you're over that, it's even just greater because it eliminates those busts. They just go with one another. You, so those last three classes can yeah. be that core to be a good long – that have that manufactured depth you talked about. And then about. you look at 2017, and it was a class that, you know, 18 signees, 17 enrolled, Damian Miller didn't qualify. But I'm going to run down the list of signees. Like, you think about this was the transition class that Herman was like, ah, oh, we're just trying to find some guys, yeah. blah, blah, blah. The one that was supposed to – low, the low, it, it was, was like 25th, really, 25th. Yeah, the lowest rated class in the right. modern era or whatever. I'm just going to run down these names, and you stop me when you hear somebody that you think has no chance to contribute. Sam Ellinger, Tennille Carter, Taquan Graham, Gary Johnson, Montrell Estelle, Josh Thompson, Reese Leto, Marquez Bimage, Kobe Boyce, Derek Kerstetter, Danny Young, Jordan Pouncey, Cade Brewer, Sam Cosme, Max Cummins, Jamari Chisholm, Josh Rowland. And get to the last five. I mean, I mean, other I, I, I could I, I could be nitpicky and name you a guy too. That I think is not the guys yeah, that I'd redshirted be, last year. As I said, I'd be yeah. very, being very nitpicky. But I mean, yeah. like you're it's, going all the way down, like to like Jamari Chisholm is the second lowest rated player in this class, and he's at least going to be he made some a plays role player for you on defense. Yeah, he was in in that Oklahoma game making some plays. There, there were nine hundred nine according to the twenty four seven Sports composite. There were nine hundred ninety six prospects rated higher than Cade Brewer in the twenty seventeen class. I think Cade Brewer is going to outperform that ranking at some point. <laughs> oh, <over>. there's <laughs> no doubt. I mean, if he hasn't already, I just no, love that nowadays. That's how in depth recruiting gets. That we have them actually ranked, and I'm going to bump this guy down from nine ninety three to nine ninety six like Derek, today. Derek Kerstetter overall in the country six hundred and twenty. Derek yeah. Kerstetter played last year better than the 620th ranked prospect in his class. How much of it could be coaching, though, too? That's Reece big. Le- you know Reece mean? Leto, 499. Yeah, like, coaching and development is something that we, we, we can't account for. We can't really quantify. Yeah, but that's a big part of it, too. And that's and that's why, the fit, and then it turns those busts into contributors if you can just get something out of them. And, I mean, you either screwed up by misidentifying the talent or you didn't develop it at that point. It was like they can figure it out well, after that. Rod, we've talked about time and again with Tom Herman's roster management, the fact that he cannot afford to waste a scholarship. So every no. kid you offer, every yeah. commitment you take – you're never going to be 100% sure because you're going to have misses, but you better be as damn close to 100% as you can that this guy, not only can, like, you've got to figure out not can this guy play. I mean, if you're offering him and he can't play, why the hell are you offering a guy? But you've got to figure out how's he going to assimilate to our culture? How's he gonna Is he going to be a problem in the locker room? Yeah. Can he handle being to Texas academically? Like, you got to run through all that. So it's a tall task, man, when you've got a roster that's this really depleted of talent at several position groups, mm-hmm. you've got to – like Mac, when you look at that 2013 class, that was a case of getting talented guys. But you got some talented guys that were knuckleheads. Yeah, mm-hmm. not everybody was the right fit. Right. If you're Tom Herman, you can't get talented knuckleheads. You've got to get talented guys that you can hang – you can count on being around for a while. Yeah, you got to be really careful about, you know, the fit, the compatibility, because you just can't afford – you don't have the luxury. Yeah. Right. 
and that's the thing you afforded that luxury and like it when you were mac back in the day because you could you knew that you were going to get top end talent the competition wasn't necessarily as good so you can win with maybe less but you can take a risk on a guy and not worry about a bust on a remote because the top end is so high that you can take a risk on a guy that maybe isn't going to make it in nowadays be a lot tougher to do that but yeah. that's that's why that but tom herman's being diligent because mac the remonts thing i think there were some other guys Great, that he recruited so. robert joseph james yeah. henry yeah. where i think mac started just like well you know let's just make sure we're getting basically you put the good kid part really equal to or above how good of a player is he and can we develop him and is he going to get any better once he's here and yeah, that was like, a tough predicament. You can see throughout the 06 to 09 classes where Mac was searching for what do we need. He thought, you know, it was still we can offer, we can get it. And he found out some guys weren't necessarily the were hard workers that they were or weren't staying out of trouble. Yeah, you got to figure out the right thing because VY, he can regulate a locker room differently than Colt can. Yep. Not saying yep. one's better than the other, but they're different styles of leadership. Mm-hmm. So you got to put different players around them recognizing your what talent. their leadership qualities are. Right. That's Coach, a big Coach's part locker of it. room is going to be different than VY's locker room. And I Chris Sims' locker room is different than Major's locker room, which is why we're getting quarterback competitions where I can be so divisive. Yeah. But I think, this, I, mean? I think, too, Rod, I think this is why Tom Herman, why the Yancey McKnight hire was so big because I think now you're leaning more on coach leadership right now than player yeah. leadership. Player leadership will take over at some point. It's it got will. If to. your coach is right. It's got Yeah, it's if got to. coach is right, it It's will. got to. But yeah. I think for right now, uh, having Yancey McKnight in place, knowing that it, it, the buck stops with Tom Herman, I think everybody in that program knows that. I think that's part of what helps your culture. We can pick up this conversation next week, and we've got plenty of time to talk about it, but it's fascinating stuff it nonetheless fascinating. to look at bust rates and, and how Tom Herman's going to manage this roster after years of mismanagement <laughs> prior to his arrival. Matt, thanks for everything, man. Oh, you're more than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network, 104.9 The Horn, hornfm.com, AM 1260, worldwide on the Horn app, where you can hear Rod B. each and every week from 1 to 3 on the Rodcast. Shameless plug. And thanks to Matt, you get us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, anywhere you get your podcasts, and always get our archives on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I am Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.